So it's only one day before the midterm elections in the United States, um, and it is a decisive um, election. I'm here today with our transatlantic team um, who are following the elections very closely, and we are, do, uh, we are here to do a little bit of pre-election um, analysis. Um, we will take a look at uh, the most important races, the topics, and also what it means for transatlantic uh, relations. Um, this is Wiebke Wartenberg. Wiebke is responsible um, for our state-to-state -state legislative dialogue. So you take a very close look also at the state level. Um, Wiebke, what are the most important topics in the elections this year? So the economy has consistently been the number one issue for voters in this year's midterm election. And this continues to hold true for the final days before the election as well. U.S. citizens are really worried about the economic crisis, inflation, rising consumer prices and gas prices. And this is really what they see and feel in their everyday life when they drive by a gas station, for example. So this is what is closest to them. And Republicans have really been pushing to make the economy and inflation the central issue of this year's election campaign. And they have also been pretty consistent nationally with their message on it. Democrats, on the other hand, uh, they were not as successful in really conveying a cohesive economic narrative and were not as successful in really explaining their approach to the economy. Um, the Biden administration has really tried to push positive economic news, uh, especially also in, last, in the last weeks, such as the inflation will decline soon, gas prices have already fallen, uh, the unemployment rate is pretty low. Um, but according to recent opinion polls, the majority of Americans still believe the economy is headed in the wrong direction. And this is uh, pretty bad news for Democrat, Democrats when it comes to the midterms. Um, and while the Republicans have really been consistent with pushing the economy narrative, Democrats have focused on a variety of issues ranging from abortion to social safety uh, to also democracy. But none of these seem to have stuck as well as the economy issue. Um, the issue of, of, of um, abortion, of course, rose in importance after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade uh, back in June. And Democrats were really hopeful that this would be a central issue in this year's election campaign. And it does continue to play strongly for Democratic voters, and it will probably bring a lot more people to the polls. Um, but it still fades uh, in importance in comparison to the economy issue. Uh, Democrats have also tried to really put uh, the democracy issue back at the top of voters' priority list, uh, the voters' priority list in recent days. Um, they argue that a Republican return to power might really harm American democracy, especially with the Republican Party having nominated so many election deniers up and down the ballot uh, across the country. Um, and even Biden, he gave a speech last Wednesday on the topic again, and he said the uh, midterm elections, it's, it's not a referendum on his administration, uh, but more so a decision on the future of American democracy. So they are really trying hard to put this back on the agenda. But I still think the economy is uh, so present in people's mind that it will be the decisive issue when they make their final vote. So it's the economy again, stupid? Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, you could really say that. Yeah. And uh, people don't vote on uh, democracy in their ballot? I think it's just uh, when you look at people in their everyday life, um, They're worried about, you know, how are, how are they going to pay their groceries? How are, gonna, how are they going to pay for gas? Um, I think democracy is important for American people, but it is second choice um, if you have the comparison. And uh, as I think also Republicans, um, there are Republicans voters who are worried about democracy, but from a different angle. Um, they really think there might be election fraud again because the Republicans have been pushing this issue. So it's also very different for Democrats and for Republicans what it means to be worried about American democracy in the end. Hmm. And um, how is Biden helping? Is he helping? Well, his approval ratings were not so good in recent weeks. So uh, I think some Democrats were also happy that he didn't, he wasn't too present in, in their districts uh, or in uh, where they, you know, where they get the votes. Um, so he's, of course, trying to help, but I think he's pa trying to paint a bigger picture, such as it really is about American democracy. He's not trying to, to get into really certain elections, but of course he is, I mean, he is the president, so he is going to be there and he, he, it will be also a, a vote about him in the end. Mm -hmm. 
And um, he's not the only one who's doing um, campaign support. Obama is too, right? And uh, Trump is too? Yeah. Uh, Trump, uh, Trump is too. They, um, they've Pennsylvania has been a state where they have all been present, um, where they are giving campaign speeches. Um, Obama has also talked about democracy. Actually, he has pretty much like Biden uh, has turned this about, may, or tried to make this about American democracy. Yeah. And Trump, of course, I mean, yeah, he's he's always present. I feel, and he is of course also present in this election and is pushing, um, I think also pushing voters by saying he will probably um, announce uh, whether he's going to run again uh, in 2024. So mm -hmm. I think that's also a way to really bring voters to the polls uh, tomorrow. Yeah, maybe on both sides of the aisle. Maybe. Yeah. Ma maybe we'll see, we'll see. So Katja, um, you are responsible for our transatlantic agriculture dialogue um, and you are an American. That yeah, true. that is true. <laughs> yeah. From which state are you? From North Carolina. North Carolina yeah. of all states. Mm -hmm. right. So a big Senate race there this year, but uh, looking like it's leaning towards Republicans, so not as close as some of the others. Tell us a little bit about um, the main and most important races and how it looks like and uh, who are the candidates and if there are um, surprises in there for you. Yeah, yeah it's, it's tough because they're just the sheer number of races that are happening across the country. But I think there are certainly some states and some races that will have a significant influence and a yeah, overwhelming influence on the way the majorities in Congress and in the Senate turn out. Um, so I'm looking at Pennsylvania uh, very closely, the race between Fetterman and uh, Mehmet Oz. Uh, Mehmet Oz was endorsed by Trump, and um, Fetterman unfortunately suffered a stroke earlier in the election, which has impacted that race quite a bit. Um, I'm looking at Arizona, where we see uh, Blake Masters um, versus the incumbent Senator Mark Kelly. And I think there it's especially interesting also to look at how the Latino vote, vote turns out, because I think, you know, that will kind of give us some idea of how 2024 looks uh, in the next election cycle. Michigan is another very important race for Senate. Uh, Whitmer um, who is defending her incumbency, but also, you know, at the congressional level there, we see um, Slotkin, who uh, is defending her seat in a, in a race that will really be kind of, it will show us where the tailwinds are in terms of, of who's uh, taking control there. There are many others. Georgia is also a really important race, but I think it's also important to take a look at uh, governors and secretary of state, which maybe don't get as much attention typically, just because they'll have such a huge influence on election procedure heading into 2024. Mm. Yeah, now that is uh, very, very um, interesting. Um, could you explain to us again why these are called midterm elections and who's actually on the ballot? Yeah, yeah. So in the midterm elections means that it's uh, in the mid term of the presidential term. So Biden was elected two years ago, and this is uh, the first time that the entire House of Representatives will be uh, rep voted on. Uh, since he took office, and then a third of the Senate is being voted on. Um, 36 governors are up for election this year and 27 secretary of states. But then we also see many races at the state and local level um, that are also up for election. So big year. Mm. And it's also a big year because the uh, majorities for the Democrats are really uh, small, right? In the That is true. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the Senate is as tight as it could be, um, basically. And so heading into election day, um, Republicans have the advantage just because um, they have the momentum and, and can don't need to pick up as many seats as um, the Democrats need mm -hmm. to defend. And usually, um, if you have a unified government where the president and, and the Congress is the hands of one party, usually the majority party loses in the midterms, right? That is absolutely true. I think only one time since uh, World War II that it's happened um, that uh, the 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 ruling party of the president's party has has been able to pick up seats so it's not looking great historically for um for democrats heading into the election so on the hispanic vote um it is often said that the uh, republicans overlooked the hispanic um, and that the democrats took them for granted where are they leaning and are they really a homogeneous group certainly not homogeneous i think that's been an assumption in past elections and was very much proven wrong in the most recent presidential. Um, 
you see different segments, so Cubans typically tend to vote more Republican, um, but I think uh, it'll be really decisive tomorrow to see how that demographic group is um, shifting and looking into future elections. Um, I think it, it'll be an interesting an interesting look. I'm not, I don't want to forecast what that exactly looks out, looks to be. Mm. So. And um, have you already voted? I did. I actually am lucky to live in a state where I can vote very early, especially mm -hmm. absentee. So I voted in early September <laughs> by uh, online, actually. So quite easy for North Carolinians. Oh, wow. That is uh, very progressive. It's not as progressive in all states, right? And there were some um, laws passed by state legislators which actually do not make it easier to vote, right? Yeah, definitely. I think, um, and that's what we should expect more of um, if Republicans take uh, take over and, and pick up seats in this election year. Um, it varies very much by state. So also for campaigns, you know, keeping on on top of those election laws and, and how best to get out voters is really important. No, thank you so much. Um, then we will take an especially close look at uh, North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> This brings us to the transatlantic side. So um, I would say no elections in the world get that much attention as the US elections, right? certainly the presidential elections, but also the midterm elections, um, the Senate races, but now also the governor races. Um, lots of lots of media attention. Um, so Philip, um, you are responsible for our um, cities, Transatlantic Cities program. Um, so you also look a lot at the subnational level um, and you have a, a very good feeling what's going on in the United States. Why should we be interested in, in the election? Why does it matter for transatlantic uh, relations? Yeah, I definitely think that it will have a big impact beyond the United States. On the one hand, it will depend on who gains control or keeps control. So if we say that the Democrats are able to maybe keep the Senate, we will have a different picture than when we will have a real red wave, for example. On the one hand, I would say that the Democrats and Biden have been able to pass a lot of legislation already, the infrastructure bill, the Inflation Reduction Act or the CHIPS Act. So we will see the effects of um, these pieces of legislation um, on climate or on the economy. But on the other hand, some things will change, especially on the international stage. Still some continuity, for example, when it comes to China policy, here we have a bipartisan consensus mostly, I would say. But as we've seen in the media recently, Republicans kind of have a different outlook on um, Ukraine and support for Ukraine. So Biden actually could struggle a bit going forward in um, keeping up the support for Ukraine and um, deterring Russia. Domestically, of course, we've had the January 6th committee. Um, we could now see in a Republican Congress other investigations into Hunter Biden, for example, or into um, Afghanistan. On the state level, of course, we have a lot of important elections, especially when it comes to abortion rights, because now after the Supreme Court ruling, it's being decided on the state level. So um, Republican lawmakers here might actually go forward and restrict abortion rights even more. Um, however, I think this election once again demonstrates for Europeans that it's important to step up now in the transatlantic relationship. Um, more than ever, we've kind of believed or thought that America is back now, but we see that it's also a bit fragile. So it's important that um, we also put in the work to move forward and to build um, new frameworks to strengthen our relationships. And as we've said before, 2024 is right around the corner. We could see the ret return of Trump. So maybe clouds ahead, but um, so far I think We've put the transatlantic relationship on quite a solid footing, but we still need to put in a bit more work. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Philip. Um, I couldn't agree more. I mean, there are lots of initiatives uh, going on, um, like the uh, Transatlantic Trade and Technology Council, um, and some conflicts have been solved, some haven't, um, and some new ones are on the horizon. Not everybody is so happy with the CHIPS Act um, and and um, how it discriminates against um, European uh, companies, or at least European companies think that it very strongly discriminates. So there are some new 
conflicts definitely on the horizon, um, and it makes a lot of sense to solve these um, before, <laughs> before the upcoming presidential elections. Philip, do you think that the focus um, is going to shift more, Biden's focus is going to shift more from the national level to the international level if he can't pass any laws anymore because he's losing uh, the majorities in Congress? I actually would say that we will see an intensified focus on domestic politics for Biden and the Democrats. I think, once again, the elections demonstrate that the polarization in the US is very deep. We see a lot of um, internal disagreements and conflicts. And I would say that, um, of course, it will be more difficult for Biden to pass legislation um, that impacts the domestic level, but now is not the time to lose focus and um, invest more in global diplomacy, even though we would maybe wish for um, a strong US presence in the transatlantic relationship or in the Indo-Pacific. But I feel like it's more important now to really also turn home a bit and look into how we can maybe overcome or counter these trends that we've been seeing and um, really see that US democracy remains stable and healthy. And I feel like that is really something that in the coming two years we will see a lot more focus on. So we as Europeans and Germans, uh, we have an interest in a successful Biden administration and she, we, we should also work towards, towards it um, and trying to make it a success. We certainly try to do so as Aspen Institute with our mm -hmm. transatlantic programs, uh, bringing different actors and stakeholders mm -hmm. together and also developing ideas. So not just networking, but really working on um, global concerns, uh, big global questions, and trying to look at uh, or for um, solutions together. Um, so now um, we come to the conclusion, and um, certainly I have to ask you what you think um, will be the outcome um, of the of the elections. Um, it's a little bit a look into the tea leaves um, or the the, the glass bowl, um, but I still I'm I'm uh, very interested in hearing um, what you think will we will be saying tomorrow. I think I have to say, it's, it's, if I had to, to put a guess out there, um, based on historical precedent, I, I would say that I'm tending towards the Republicans taking the House and Senate. Um, I do think we'll see a huge uh, voter turnout, which is never a bad thing. And a huge voter turnout also in the uh, younger population? I do think so. I think it's interesting what Vibka was saying about the different issues that are motivating voters. Um, I think they are very different depending on which party people identify with, but it, they are motivating across the board. Um, and and you, are you expecting a red wave? Like a I, I, I don't, I think it'll be close. I do based on the polling that we've seen too, um, although that, you know, we can question how accurate that is. And I think that'll be another big learning from tomorrow is how much we can rely on those polls in the upcoming elections. But um, I, I think it'll be close, but I, I do give the edge to Republicans. Yeah. Interesting. So Vipke, what do you think? I do have to agree. I think Republicans are going to take the House. I think uh, it looks pretty sure. Um, if you look at the polls, um, I mean, you never know what's going to happen if, when people actually vote. But still, I think the House will go to Republicans. With the Senate, it really is a coin flip at this point. And I mean, I, you can only guess. Um, but if you look at recent trends, Republican have, Republicans have been um, getting better in the polls. So I would also say the Senate will, will go to Republicans, just if you look at the recent days, how things are developing. Mm -hmm. Um, before I ask you, um, what, what are the parties actually doing to get out of, uh, get out the vote? Do you know? Um, well, they are really on the ground now. I mean, uh, pretty much uh, very different people in the party are getting out there, really doing trips throughout the country, um, three, four states in one day sometimes even, um, really trying to motivate the people um, to really get out there and vote. And um, yeah, I think this is what everybody has been focusing on in the last days mm -hmm. moving up to tomorrow. Yeah. And I guess lots of campaign ads. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, campaign ads are also a very uh, interesting topic in every election. Uh, I think, especially for us Germans, we we are not used to American campaign ads. It's it's not comparable. Um, so it's always also very interesting and fun to see uh, what the campaigns come up with, mm. what kind of ads. And uh, we had the final ads um, were pushed out. I think about last week. Um, 
and it has been interesting to watch that as well and they have also been very different usually it's mostly a summary of the whole um, campaign so far but some have really now focused on on individual issues again really getting back to the economy and the high prices so that has been interesting to watch as well mm. and katja lots of canvassing footwork on the ground yes i have my own experience on that <laughs> from from the the past but yeah lots of knocking on doors and i, I think it's really interesting too what issues the the campaigns are picking up on and and actually that's a, a point about referendums too there are referenda across the country mostly on abortion and and uh, marijuana legalization are the big ones but how campaigns then use those also to drive up turnout is is kind of interesting to watch so you did uh, canvassing door to door I, I did <laughs> it was it was a great experience i think talking with um, voters you really realize what people are interested in. Um, some people don't want to talk to you, but, <laughs> but you know, that's a learning opportunity as well. Oh, absolutely. I also did so in my early 20s in Michigan. Um, this German girl walking from door to door, um, canvassing for um, uh, the uh, Democratic whip, David Bonnier, um, that raised some eyebrows uh, with my German accent. <laughs> but it's a great, uh, great experience. Yeah. Um, so last but not least, um, what is your expectation? Well, I think one of the lessons of 2016 is that there can always be surprises in a way. But looking at, at the last few weeks, I mean, I would expect that um, Republicans or there will be some form of red wave and Republicans will um, control both the Senate and the House of Representatives. However, however, I think that that's why it's really interesting to also look at the subnational races. I mean, we also have a mayoral election in Los Angeles, the second biggest city in the US. We have, as Katya mentioned, the um, elections of secretaries of state. So that's now where um, we see also beyond 2024 how the US might um, evolve and where we see um, important trends also when it comes to minority voter voters or young voters. So I think probably in Congress, there isn't much um, to debate anymore, but a lot more action on the subnational level, which is, of course, also very interesting to us in our projects. So very last question. Our viewers, our audience, if you recommended them like one thing to watch for tomorrow, what would you do? Mm. I mean, I think the elephant in the room is um, is how much Trump has influenced these elections and how much that is going to uh, influence the country moving forward. So I would watch those races where he's endorsed um, probably most closely. Um, we know we're also expecting any moment now his announcement for the next uh, presidential race. So I think um, that will shape the country in a huge way moving forward. In that and you would watch uh, CNN, Fox, NPR? Ah. <laughs> uh, you know, what? the best way would be to watch a mix <laughs> um, because you do get very different messages depending uh -huh. on where you're watching. Um, I'm partial to podcasts, so mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm very into um, The Daily from The New York mm -hmm. Times. Um, I do listen to NPR. Um, those would be my, my choices. <laughs> All right. And do you have a favorite show? I do like to watch CNN, but I also do like to switch channels because just what Katya said, it is interesting to hear you have the same results, but um, the different channels make very different things out of it. So that's also interesting to watch. Yeah, different interpretations. Um, yeah. And, and some, somewhat also sometimes different polls. Yeah. 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 Philip, favorite show? Um, maybe one other thing. I would maybe wait until the day after tomorrow, oh, okay. actually, because we've seen that a lot of the actual results come in a bit later than we're used to. Um, but then, in addition to what my colleagues have also mentioned, I'm looking forward to see what late night makes of the midterm elections at mm. the end of the week mm. and kind of like the more lighter side and the lighter interpretations mm. of the election results, which sometimes is um, more informative than the news in these times, I would say. Well, it's certainly sometimes more fun. Um, exactly. Thank you so much, the three of you. Um, I hope um, that we sit together again after the elections. Um, and um, it's going to be an interesting day and night tomorrow and probably also an interesting Wednesday. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.